Hello, my name's Richard Felix, and I'm going to take you on a tour of haunted Oxfordshire. Here I am standing in the little village of Minster Lovell in the middle of summer. Beautiful Oxfordshire countryside, children and families picnicking down by the river. But I'm actually going to take you on a tour of the darker side of Oxfordshire. Some of the stories that you're going to hear are going to be of real ghosts and real hauntings. Others are going to be what I believe only to be recordings to do with tragic, traumatic, premature death, such as murders, suicides, battles, executions, and accidents. I believe that their time hadn't come and the energy used by the body in resisting death can be so immense that that actual event just before death can be recorded into the actual fabric of a building. Bricks, woodwork, plaster, mortar, possibly even the soil, but especially into stone. There was a program a few years ago on the television called The Stone Tapes. And I believe that with so much energy being used moments before death, that the actual event just before death can be recorded here into the stonework and replayed later like pressing the play button of a video player. And you see the event again exactly the same as it was when it was recorded. Sometimes, of course, the image appears to be headless or legless, and that's purely and simply because the building has changed in those years since the death took place. So sit back, turn down the lights, give me your full attention, and let me take you on a tour of haunted Oxfordshire. And what better place to start this tour of haunted Oxfordshire than here in the ghostly ruins of Minster Lovell. Lord Lovell was a supporter of the pretender Lambert Simnel who was trying to take the throne from King Henry VII. Simnel was defeated and Lord Lovell escaped back here to his home. He spent many years in hiding in an underground passage, attended by only one servant who was the only person that knew his whereabouts. Sadly, that manservant died, leaving Lord Lovell entombed somewhere underneath this building. Many, many years later, when this hall was being renovated in 1718 and the incident had taken place in 1487, a skeleton was found seated at a table underneath this building. At his feet was the skeleton of his dog. And apparently due to the death of his servant, with no one to fend for him, he died. And his ghost has been reported seen on many occasions wandering around the grounds of this magnificent old ruined hall. There is another ghost story connected with a descendant of Lord Lovell, a William Lovell, who came here to celebrate his wedding with his wife. A huge banquet was put on here, and halfway through the proceedings, his beloved wife disappeared. A search was made, and she was never found. Three years later, servants searching in the attics 
of the building found a large wooden crate that held her wedding gown. They opened the heavy lid and found the skeleton of his betrothed, still dressed in the wedding gown, entombed inside that wooden crate. And they say that on a dark, windy night, you can still hear the cries of that poor, unfortunate woman trying to get out of the crate in the attic. Now earlier in the video I mentioned that um, stone and various other fabrics can contain a recording. Ghosts are very much to do with energy. Heat of course being energy and this is why you get cold spots in a room as a ghost is wanting to appear it draws the heat or the energy from the room to use to appear in, in front of someone or to move something but of course there's also another form of energy which of course is electromagnetic fields and since I've been doing this national ghost tour of Great Britain um, a friend of mine Jason Carl who appears on the uh, most haunted programs on television has sent me this EMF meter which detects electromagnetic fields. Now all animals emit electromagnetic frequencies of some sort and all you do is press this little button and wander around with it hopefully detecting some form of energy which could well be still stored if you like in the fabric or in the stonework of this building. It has to be kept horizontal and you just have to wait to see or hear if a sound comes from it which means there is some form of energy in here. Now we've certainly there's something happening here. Now there are no wires. There's, I mean, this is a derelict building. This is a ruin going back to the 15th century. There's, there's sounds coming out of this now here, um, and there are no wires. There's absolutely nothing electrical in here at all. I was definite. Um, I don't know what. I can't feel anything. There's no cold spots. But this is certainly telling me that something is being emitted from this stonework right here. Um, I don't know what. All I can say is that uh, it's a good job it's daylight. This is one of the most haunted crossroads in Oxfordshire. It's on the A4260 and behind me a very, very old coaching inn called Hopcroft's Holt. It's got lots of haunted bedrooms and it's also haunted by a famous highwayman, a Frenchman who came over after the restoration of King Charles II. His name, Claude Duval. So let's go inside and explore. Now inside the reception of Hopcroft's Holt, the whole area is themed with pictures of the building as it was and of course pictures of highwaymen but it's not only haunted by a highwayman there are quite a few stories to do with the bedrooms upstairs so come and join me let's go and have a look and I'm now entering one of the haunted bedrooms. This is room number three. And I suppose the vast majority of the hauntings tend to go on here. This, of course, is in the old original part of the building, which goes back actually to the 1400s. 
and there are various things that have happened to customers. Nothing, nothing horrible. Um, one lady and gentleman asleep one night, and all of a sudden they felt the bedclothes being tugged from the bottom, and they were actually pulled halfway off them. But strangely enough, all they did was pull the bedclothes back up, as you do. Next morning, of course, went down and, and just mentioned it to the reception, and they said, oh yeah, which, which room were you in? Room number three. Oh yes, they said, yes, the haunted bedroom. And I'm actually in the bridal suite, room number 25, coming out of this, well, absolutely magnificent bathroom, four poster bed, if any room should be haunted, by Jove, well, this one should be. But, um, apart from the fact that we've had to change frequency uh, on the camera and the mic because we can't get a signal, and I've already had two phone calls in this room and both of them have vanished. There is no signal, so there's something going on in here. But apparently room 24 next door is active at the moment, and they're telling me that the maids won't actually work on their own. Things are happening. They're hearing footsteps while they're in there. Windows, they can hear opening and closing. And on two occasions, when there was no one in the room, one of the maids came in to find the curtains drawn closed. And she knows for a fact that she'd drawn them open. So they've got to the stage now where it's a case of, well, let's go and do room 24. But I'm not going alone. I'm walking along the 60s corridor, known as that because the rooms are numbered 60. Um, I'm up in the gods. This is uh, the attic rooms and there's a, there's a feel about it. Apparently the waitresses and the maids won't come up here, don't like coming up here alone. And a lady called Tanya, who is the wife of the chef, they used to live up here. She reported cold spots, a presence. Even when she was alone, she never felt as if she was. It seemed as if there was someone with her. She doesn't live up here now, but apparently she more or less refuses to come up here. And certainly under no circumstances will ever come alone. She has to be accompanied by somebody living. I'm sitting inside the original part of Hopcroft's Holt, this old ancient coaching inn, only 10 miles from the centre of Oxford on the crossroads. It's reputedly haunted by the ghost of a highwayman called Claude Duval, this famous highwayman that worked Hampstead Heath on many occasions but used this building, A, as his base, and B, to rob many coaches that passed by at this crossroads. On one occasion, quite a famous occasion, he held up the London stagecoach. On it was a gentleman and a beautiful looking woman. The gentleman came out and was about to take his purse out to give it to Duval when his wife started to play a flute. She was still sitting in the coach. Duval was so taken with it that he actually asked one of his henchmen to take the flute off the young lady and play it, while he asked the lady to dance with him in the moonlight, while the husband was looking on. At the end of it, he asked for payment and took 100 guineas off the lady's husband. From then on, Duval used to travel with a musician, just in case he met another beautiful lady to dance with. 
that Duval's last dance was at Tyburn in 1670, when he danced a jig at the end of the hangman's rope and was buried in St Paul's in Covent Garden. His gravestone is gone, but we do have a copy of the inscription. Here lies Duval, reader, if male thou art, look to thy purse, if female, to thy heart. Much havoc has he made of both, for all. Men he made stand, and women he made fall. The second conqueror of the Norman race, knights to his arms did yield, and ladies to his face. Old Tyburn's glory, England's illustrious thief, Duval, the lady's joy, Duval, the lady's grief. And to this very day, Claude Duval still haunts this inn and has been seen on many occasions sitting in this very chair here. In fact, only a fortnight ago, I was told there was a conference here and a lady walking through to the bar asked the barman, what was that reenactor doing sitting in the chair? He looked like a highwayman. What a quaint idea for an inn like this, she said. Oh no, madam, the barman said. We don't employ reenactors. That was the ghost of Claude Duval. And I'm now standing outside Oxford Airport. I've been sent here by the gateman at Blenheim Palace. And he told me there's a ghost here on the airfield. Apparently his wife used to be a cleaner here. Part of it is now an air training college. And he told me that the simulator is haunted. Haunted by the ghost of a young airman. Because during the Second World War, this was an Air Force base. And apparently none of the cleaners will go into that simulator for fear of seeing the ghostly airman. He'd come back off a raid, climbed down from his plane, and walked into one of the propellers that was still spinning and was decapitated. And they say that his ghost haunts the simulator but also has been seen on frequent occasions wandering away from the control tower along the pathway down here to the road and for some strange reason has then been seen walking along this roadway disappearing. It's been seen by one or two people at work here and also motorists, lorry drivers and taxi drivers driving along this road. They see him standing at the side of the road. They think that he's filming a lift. They slow up, stop and then he just vanishes from view. I'm standing in the little quaint parish church of Yarnton and behind me the tomb of Sir William Spencer, knight, lord of this manor, third son of Sir John Spencer of Althorpe. He was the squire of Yarnton Manor, which is just across the road from this church, and I'm told there are many ghost stories to do with that building. So we'll just uh, wander across the road and have a look. I'm walking down Church Lane at Yarnton. I'm literally following in the footsteps of 6,000 
royalist soldiers led by no less than King Charles I, who escaped from Oxford after being besieged by Oliver Cromwell's soldiers. He and his troops marched down this lane on June the 3rd, 1644, and escaped from Oxford. They passed these gates. These are the gates to Yarnton Manor, a royalist stronghold, the home of the Spencer family. This building was then used as a hospital and many, many royalist soldiers died here. There are many reports of soldiers still walking around both the grounds of the building and also in the upper floors. And people say that on a dark, windy night that they can still hear the footsteps of Charles's army trudging wearily along the road in front of these gates. But there are many, many stories. This is a very, very haunted building. There's a black man, a servant, here at the hall that was having an affair with one of the Spencer's daughters. And they hanged him in front of the building. His ghost still walks around the area of the front door. And the lady that he was having an affair with has often been seen sitting on a little window seat at the top of the stairs, sobbing and weeping. There's many other stories to do with soldiers, grey ladies, white ladies. In fact, this is probably one of the most haunted buildings in Oxfordshire. Upstairs in the long gallery, a story of one of the cleaners vacuuming up, standing in the middle of the room. All of a sudden, she felt two hands on her shoulders and she thought, it was the gardener who was always playing tricks on her, including putting spoons in her pockets and jumping out from various places because there's lots of priest holes in the building. She turned round and swore at him. There was no one there. She was totally alone and very scared. There's another story of some people downstairs in one of the classrooms. They were having an exam and they came out and asked the receptionist can you please give us some history of the building? We feel that there's something strange in this classroom. It was a very large panelled room. And they said that although there was only three of them in there, they could sense that there was a fourth person. Someone else was in there with them. They could actually hear footsteps and see the old oak boards moving as phantom footsteps were walking over them. Needless to say, they never finished the exam, or at least not in that room. Now, I have gained a real scoop here. I'm actually inside Yarnton Manor, and we've managed to, how can I put it, um, get the folks here to allow us to come in and film. This building now is a private institution belonging to Oxford University and I must hasten to add is not open to the public. So we are so lucky to be able to come inside because there are so many ghost stories to do with the place. It actually goes back to a Saxon farmhouse in about the year 1005 and I'm in the Great Hall, extremely atmospheric place, but strangely enough, in this little bit here, no ghosts. They're in other parts of the building, so come with me on a haunted tour of Yarnton Manor. Staircase is through here. Magnificent oak panelling. Jacobean Manor House. And here, the first reported sighting of a ghost. Seen by a lady called Sylvia, 
who was at a party here and she saw a girl sitting on this window seat sobbing. She's believed to be the girl that was having the affair with the black man that was hanged in front of the building. Continuing onwards and ever upwards onto the landing. Remember of course that this building was used during the English Civil War as a hospital and the number of deaths that must have taken place here. A gentleman told me that he used to live here and he used to line milk bottles up here and he went to bed and the following morning all the milk bottles would be knocked over. It didn't happen once, it happened on frequent occasions. Continuing on through here and in here is the conference room, the long gallery, open specially for us this morning. Oak panelling everywhere, magnificent old fireplace and the coat of arms of the Spencer family and the door closes itself. I wonder why. Secret doorway in here. And this is the room where the students were having the exam. And they sensed that there was more than three of them. There was an extra person. They saw nothing, but actually heard footsteps and saw the floorboards moving as if someone or something very heavy was actually walking up and down here and also in this room is where the cleaner was standing hoovering or polishing the floor when a pair of hands grabbed her shoulders and she turned and swear at the person and realized that she was totally alone here in this room and looking out of the window here we can see the wonderful front gardens, the driveway leading down to Church Lane, where 6,000 of King Charles I's army trudged past on the night of the 3rd of June, 1644. And there's been a reported sighting of a soldier on horseback, a cavalier, galloping up the drive. He's always headless. And they tell me that the only day that he's ever seen is on June the 30th. Now, obviously, there's a reason for that. I know not what, but I presume that he met his death on June the 30th. And the event, if you like, is reenacted every year on that very day. We'll go back downstairs now, and there's a rather interesting toilet story. And so, to the Jacobean toilets. It is unisex, so we're okay. There was a lady at a party here at the manor, and she came here to the toilet, walked into the toilet, to find a man standing here, the ghost of a man. And he spoke to her, and he told her that all the guests should go home immediately. He was not happy. He knew this place was officers during the day, and he said people were quite at liberty to be here in the day when working, but he didn't want them here at night and she was to gather them up and take them away. Before she went, he also complained about the cupboard. He said, that's not always been there. And he didn't like it. Now, although people tend to laugh about stories to do with toilets, ghost stories, it's surprising how many ghost stories there are to do with wash houses, toilets, and bathrooms. And 
I'm not sure why, perhaps it's something to do with water, energy, ectoplasm, strain, I don't know. But of course you must remember that even Elvis Presley died on the toilet at Graceland's. And so, to take my leave of Yarnton Manor. But even outside here, in the grounds, suitable for any film set. The stories of people wandering around here in the gardens. They hear horses' hooves galloping at full pelt. And they see a cavalier mounted on a horse in full battle armour galloping down this trackway here towards the back gates of the manor house. As it gets close to the gates, it seems as if the horse puts its brakes on and slews to a halt, snorting and foam coming out of its mouth. The rider stops, dismounts from the horse and vanishes. No one knows who he is, whether he was bringing a message here, but of course, just over the back here is another part of the graveyard at Yarnton. Perhaps it's in this part of the graveyard where those royalist soldiers are buried. Nobody will ever know. This is St John's College in the centre of Oxford and it's haunted by the ghost of no less than Archbishop Lord, Bishop of Canterbury, who of course had a bit of an argument to say the least with church and parliament and was executed on Tower Hill on the orders of Oliver Cromwell in 1645. The Archbishop was buried here at St John's, underneath the altar, in the chapel of his old college. And his ghost still haunts the place to this day. At its most spectacular, it actually has its head in its hand and bowls it towards the spectator. On other occasions, he's been reported being seen walking along the floor of the library. But he's always a few inches above the floor and appears to be gliding. I presume this is due to the fact that the floor level is now at least two or three inches lower than it was when the Archbishop was executed in 1645. I'm in the graveyard of St Giles Church, right in the centre of Oxford, on a beautiful sunny afternoon. Nothing seems more ghostly, but strangely enough there is the ghost of a grey lady that wanders around this graveyard. She's been seen on many occasions by ordinary folks in the middle of Oxford, by revellers at night, obviously those revellers may be suffering from too many spirits behind the bar. But it's the ordinary folks that have seen her that make me believe that she is real, that she has been seen here. She's seen wandering and stopping and stooping and looking at the gravestones and shaking her head and then continuing and looking at other gravestones. They say that it's the ghost of a grey lady who died in the 18th century. She had left a considerable amount of money to local charities, but the money never got to them. It's believed that her family got hold of the money first 
and of course spent it. And I believe that is the reason that she still haunts. I don't know whether she's buried here or not, but certain people haunt places sometimes because they love the place, they love the house and so they want to stay in it. They haunt people because they love the people. Some people even haunt cars because they love them so much and if you like don't want to give them up. But other people, and I think possibly in the case of this unfortunate girl here, haunts the place because she feels that she's been hard done to. She's restless because of the fact that the money that she left to go to charities never reached them. And so, until she can be released, her tormented soul will still wander around this beautiful little churchyard here in the centre of Oxford. I've never been in prison before, but what a prison to be in. This is Oxford Prison and um, it's being turned into a hotel and they very, very kindly allowed us to actually come in and, and just film before it all disappears. Um, porridge was filmed here. This is the area where they actually used to play dominoes and eat their lunch here. And over here, this cell, last year, Brad Pitt was in this cell actually making a film. But I've never seen anything quite like it. The doors, all original, the bolts, the peepholes still there. This one's completely jammed that they looked through at the prisoners. But I'm told that the ominous part is down here, the dark bit. The condemned cells and the execution drop are somewhere down here. It's getting a bit darker now. The original metal gates still here as we wander down the cells still preserved on the right hand side and the left hand side. Condemned cell here and on as the poor unfortunate condemned would walk down this corridor with the executioner, the jailer, the padre and into here and this rather dark austere room here is the execution chamber and the actual drop is still here it's been boarded over now with new floors but there's a 12 foot drop down there. The lever was pulled, the trap door of course would fly open and they would fly through there and be launched into eternity here in this very room. And I'm just entering into this dark, dank, deep cell underneath Oxford Jail. This is one of the old original cells and would certainly have been here in 1752 when Mary Blandy was brought here and of course executed for the murder of her father. Um, there's a very strange feeling in here. You think of the, the terror, the pain, the anguish, the torment that must be impregnated into this stonework. There's actually no stories of ghosts in this actual bit here. Her ghost actually wanders outside around the area where she was executed. But regardless of that, you can still sense the in fact, you can almost smell the fear that must have been in and around this place. Um, it's not somewhere I want to stay. So, um, I think
think a sharp exit is probably quite a good idea. I'm actually in part of the exercise yard of Oxford Prison. And all around me at the back are the mounds, the burial mounds of all the poor and fortunate people that were hanged here at this jail. Because obviously Oxford was the assize town for Oxfordshire and all the executions took place either inside this building or outside the building. And of course then they were buried here in unconsecrated ground. And the um, people, the security people that are here with me today, have told me that the dogs won't come round here. Under no circumstance can they get any of the dogs to walk around this area. They've just done an excavation here, thinking that they'd found a grave. But I don't think it is. There are no bones in it at all. It's probably just a drain, but they are certainly buried over there. Mary Blandy poisoned her father in 1752. She believed that he had actually killed her lover because he didn't approve, so she killed him. And she was executed somewhere in front of where this building is now, at Westgate, in the centre of Oxford. But in those days, it wasn't a gallows and a trapdoor. It was a cart or a wagon and a horse. She would be stood on the back of the cart. It would be a public execution. All the folks from Oxford would come to watch. A white cap would be pulled over her face. The rope would be tightened. And then someone would hit the backside of the horse and the horse would draw away. And she would be left writhing, choking, struggling and vomiting and take up to approximately a quarter of an hour to die of slow strangulation. Her ghost has been seen wandering around the area of the execution mound at Westgate, where the shopping precinct is now. And while she was being executed on top of the scaffold, a large blackbird perched on top of it. And apparently, legend has it, that no blackbirds are ever seen in the area of Westgate here in Oxford. Now, believe it or not, this is a haunted telephone box. I only know of one other in the country, in Erdington, in the West Midlands, haunted by a girl in a pink cardigan who was desperately trying to ring the fire brigade to save her children. She went back into the fire and was burnt to death. But this is different. This is not haunted by a person, but is haunted by something from within. Uh, many people walking past this phone box have reported hearing it ringing in the dead of night. Anyone who answers the phone gets a dreadful, ghostly message. Someone on the other end talking to them. No one will tell me what that message was. But I would suggest that if you're at East End, North Lee, walking past this phone box at the dead of night, and it rings, that you leave it and don't answer it. I'm certainly not going to answer that, even if it is daylight. I'm sitting in one of the oldest inns in the country. I'm in Woodstock, near Blenheim Palace. And Woodstock was bestowed upon John, first Duke of Marlborough, by Queen Anne in 1704. But this building, actually goes back to 1302. It was a hostelry then. It is one of the original coaching inns of Great Britain. It's called The Bear. And of course, it's got a ghost, otherwise I wouldn't be here. The ghost 
haunts the original room number 16. I'm told that it's now room 25. But we've got someone here that knows a little bit more about it than me. So let's go upstairs and have a look and see if we can find the ghost of room 25. And I'm now entering the haunted bedroom. Room 25. With me, Mandy and Tim, who I've cajoled into <laughs> telling me more of the stories. Now, this was originally room number 16, is that right? Which I've, I've read in books is, was the haunted room. Do you know why they changed it? We changed all the room numbers to try and make it more logical as to where they go around the hotel. Oh, I see. Because it was the hotel changed and we added bits and it just got all yeah, yeah. mixed up. So yeah. we completely remembered all the rooms all around the hotel gotcha. to bring them back into some sort of loan. Yeah. But this is, this is the room? Yes, it yeah. is. Yeah. And, and tell me, I mean, what, what happens? Um, walking, you're sort of doing your room. You just, I don't know, you go sort of goosebumpy, don't you, really? You, you, um, you know you, there's no one in here at times and you can get the key from reception which normally proves there's no one in the room. Yeah. And you come in and you instantly hesitate and get that, what funny do you call it? Sort of funny it? feeling, Be don't funny you? Feeling that you can actually you sense that, that there's somebody there in here, should, even when there isn't. There should be somebody in here, yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, th there's a story that, that it was a workman about two or three hundred years ago that actually fell through the roof and, and died in here. There's that one, and also of a chambermaid with a young child that died in here as well, so... Really? And she's, she's obviously the one that you, you know more about. Yeah. I mean, uh, do things happen? Do guests sort of... Uh, guests, guests have left the room because they haven't looked it for some reason. They haven't really been able to explain why, but they've definitely really? asked to change rooms. And we uh, occasionally we get the Oxford University so-called Ghostbusters come and pay us a visit. Oh really? We need to him and yeah. see if they and can also, many, and stop them. And also, I don't know if you remember Tim, many years ago, some said they could even hear a baby crying. Do you remember that one? Well, I've heard that. I've heard that I've one. Heard that. Coming from this room? Yeah. It's also many years ago, I don't know about how long, about, about 10, 11 years. Okay. Actually, I actually had a guest that actually come out frightened, go downstairs with their underwear. And you you should fled leave, the room, you mean? And want to leave. Oh boy. Yeah. So, <laughs> so basically, if you're looking for a haunted hotel, a haunto, haunted hotel bedroom, then it's got to be room 25 of the bear at Woodstock. Yeah. Mandy, Tim, that's wonderful. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. My name's Richard Felix, and I'm here at my base at the old county jail in the centre of Derby. This place over the last 150 years has been a place of terror, torment and of course death and that's one of the reasons why this place is as haunted as it is. I've chosen Derby as the catalyst for the national ghost tour of Great Britain. Over the last 10 years, I have taken in excess of 95,000 people on a ghost tour somewhere around the Midlands. And of course, have spoken to many of those people on the tours and of course have realised just how fascinated people are by ghosts. This is the reason that we have chosen to do this tour. The video that you've just watched is a part of that series, but I want your help. If you have a ghost story, then please either email me or write to me at the address that you'll see at the end of this video. Of course, you must remember that after speaking to so many people, I think I have an ability to be able to see through some of the stories, to be able to differentiate between a story that is true or a story that's made up. And of course, you must remember that eight 
out of ten ghost stories can be explained. But it's the other two that you've got to worry about. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Do sleep well and don't have nightmares. Thank you.